Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, How to Build a Sentiment Analysis App with Hugging Face. My name is Matt Brown, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we begin, just a few logistical reminders. Today's discussion is being recorded, and you are currently in a listen-only mode. You may submit questions throughout the session using the Q&A functionality in the lower section of your Zoom console. If this is your first time joining a single store webinar, heads up that we present weekly technical workshops demoing data and AI use cases and new technologies. In fact, tomorrow we will be presenting how to build a chat GPT app using JSON data. And Madhukar, if you could click to that slide. During this time, our lead engineer, Jason, will be presenting his demo on how to perform semantic search and vector and query vector embeddings on JSON and Mongo data. It's very cool. If this topic seems fun to you, you can register right now. You can use that QR code that's on your screen or that bit.ly link that's on your screen. I will also put this in the chat in just a moment. Uh, but let me finish up uh, our introduction here. So today's topic, back to today's topic, we have fantastic technical experts that are joining our Zoom Q&A. They have a good grasp of the technologies involved. They're ready to answer your questions as soon as they come in. Uh, please welcome Akmal. We will also be having Eric Hansen join, join the virtual stage shortly. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as they come in. They can answer them interactively as they come. I will also try to flag a few of the questions for the live Q&A at the end of the session. Also, we would love for you to try out today's technology. In fact, anyone who tries it today will be entered for a chance to win brand new AirPods Pro. Uh, simply click on this link that you see on your screen or use that QR code that's on your screen. Just log into the link. It's a you know, free trial if you're a new user or an existing account if you're already a customer or an ongoing trial. And we will check the folks who have logged into that link that's on your, your slide right now. And we will announce a winner by the end of today's session. So let me introduce our speakers for today. Madhukar Kumar is our chief developer evangelist. He originally has a background in software engineering. And more recently, he has led product marketing and product management teams in the cloud data industry. And then we are also joined by Pranav Arora, who is our growth product manager here at Single Store, and he has been very active in our AI initiatives. Welcome to both of them and to our audience. Madhukar, you now have the floor. All right, thank you, Matt, and good to be back. It seems like every week we have something new to talk about and something interesting happening in Gen AI. So we have added a new section this week on what is new with AI this week. But before we get started, for a lot of folks who may not be aware of what Single Store is, just to uh, take a couple of minutes and talk about what it is so that you're grounded in the topic of how we do semantic search and vectors and so on that Pranav is gonna talk about. So Single Store is a database. And if you're familiar with MySQL, it's very similar to that. In fact, it is uh, MySQL wire protocol compatible. And it was initially known as MemSQL. So you could store row-based data, which is in memory, and then over a period of time, depending on your use, or if you define it, then that data can also be stored in columnar, both in the disk as well in S3 object. So because it's a three-tiered storage layer and the compute is different from the storage, you can do three things with the data that's stored inside a database. You can do transactions, you can do analysis, so aggregations and functions related to averaging and things like that. And finally, what we have started to see now is for interacting with large language models or building generative applications or generative AI applications, you can use single store to curate and contextualize the data for your LLMs all in split seconds. So at a very high level, you can uh, use both SQL, but we recently also added compatibility for MongoDB APIs. So you can also bring in the JSON data from Mongo. This is the next webinar that you would see with JSON. And it has support for a bunch of different other data types as well. 
time series, geospatial, and so on. And as I mentioned, you can store the data as rows or columns, which makes it extremely fast. In fact, compared to a few databases, it's like 800 times faster, faster in terms of doing aggregate functions and analytics. So as I was mentioning this week, what's new in AI this week, there are two interesting tools that I really wanted to talk about. The first one, as you can see on the left-hang side, is something called Langsmith. And if you're familiar with Langchain, Langchain is one of those libraries which allows you to take multiple different LLMs and then bring them together, chain them, and then be able to also create agents. And agents take the responses from LLMs and they go and execute functions as well. So if you want to run Langchain framework in production, you maybe want to see the debug output, you want to see what's going on behind the scenes, and you might want to do certain things to do debugging and so on. So with that in mind, Langchain team, Harrison Chase and team, they recently released Langsmith. So that's what you see over here on the left-hand side. And you can use this as a means to take Langchain code into production and includes features for data sets and testings and so on. And if you are interested in it, you can go to the website. I think it's only available by invite at this point. You can sign up for it and then you would be able to get in the queue and get uh, access to it at some point. The other tool that I wanted to talk about is Flowwise. And Flowwise is, I'm gonna share my screen very quickly here. Flowwise is a no code visual tool for Langchain. So if you can see my screen, you once you have installed and you run it, or you, you know, in my case, I'm running it on a Brender, which is a platform. You can then just go create your entire flow. So you can see that there is a agent that you can uh, install. But more importantly, in the last week or so, we also added single store as one of those components. So you can drag and drop single store as you have seen over here. And in this, you can then connect an embeddings library. You can embed or you can add a loader. And now once you put in all your functions, this can be exposed as an API. So you can add authorization. And now once you have the API, you can embed it in Python, you can embed it as a you know, even iframe. So this is like a very easy no code way to use single store and other components from Langchain in a drag and drop fashion and then quickly expose it as APIs. So these are the two quick finds from the last week in terms of uh, what's new in AI. Today, of course, we are here to talk about semantic search. So I'm gonna have hand it over to Pranav so that he can walk us through what we have built and how to go and build the exact same thing on top of single store. So Pranav, all over yeah. to you. Thanks, Malikar. I'm just gonna share my screen. Cool. So that's, as, as Malikar said, there's so much going on um, in the realm of AI and how it relates to single store. But at the core of all of this is a, term that you know has caught a lot of velocity recently and that's semantic search and at its core it's all about extracting the right meaning and context uh this is an example we like to to talk about which is how semantic search differentiates itself from lexical search if i'm just searching for hot dogs the important thing is getting the right context whether i'm referring to huskies feeling hot in 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 climates that are not suited for it or the actual hot dog food um semantic search is able to pick up on the right context and meaning and that's really, really important. And we're seeing a lot of customers, you know, really run semantic search on data um, in single store. And a great example of this is Siemens. We wrote a blog with them. Uh, the blog is linked and I'm sure you, uh, you'll have access to it on the chat. But what they're using semantic search for is understanding true meaning and true drivers of the sentiment of their employees. And this is quite important. You know, they're collecting so much data um, from so many different sources uh, regarding the employees, whether that's, you know, training reviews, glass door reviews, performance reviews, um, being able to, you know, search for it and understand key drivers, understand themes, understand, you know, what teams are doing well, what the employees are really saying, 
is now possible in single store. Um, and this 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 uh, three tier sort of thing I, I, I have on the screen right now is a is a simple architecture that explains what what really happens. We collect a bunch of sources, as Madhukar mentioned. We're really good with now with Mongo API, with with you know different types of data sources, unstructured. We're able to then create embeddings for this and store your vector embeddings in single store, a little bit more on vectors and, and, and embeddings. You're going to hear that term a lot. And then the second part of things is being able to perform a semantic search, whether that's a, a cosine similarity um, or in this case, a, a, unifold mani um, a uniform manifold approximation and, uh, and projection. And for the end user, for, for Siemens, for example, they're really able to, like I said, drive retention, satisfaction, focus on what's going well, debug what's not going well. Um, and all of this stuff stems from being able to really extract meaning and context from their data. So I guess this is what we're all here for. How do we go about conducting semantic search? There are four steps uh, to, to derive semantic meaning for your data. And the first step is always, you know, you got to prepare and tokenize the data. The second one is quite important. We'll get into it quite for the majority of this, this uh, session is what to chunk. So how do you break that data you're collecting from all your different sources? You know, in Siemens's case, they're collecting data from different types of data from so many different sources that are from different lengths. So how do you bring it into a uniform pattern that you can chunk and then create vector embeddings for? Store it and search it. And the cool thing is you can do almost all of these things natively on single store. And we have really cool developing tooling that we're building out that'll just make this easier. At the core of all of this is vectors. And I think that's something that Madhukar mentioned earlier, and I'm gonna keep alluding to. the three stages of vector process, of, of the vector life cycle that live on single store. Um, first thing is, is being able to create vectors off your data. So what a vector really is, is a, a you know, a long array of numbers that is that represents the semantic meaning of your data. And there are certain embedding models, whether that's OpenAI, uh, ADA2, or, or uh, Hugging Face API with the sentence transformers that allows you to pass in data to these models, and it gives you a vector representation of it. The next part of this is once you get these vectors, you can store them in single store in your same table. So it's very easy to have your existing data you know, get vectors for it and then just add the data to single store and store them. We have a native blob type um, that allows you to do this. So imagine you have a table. Now you have a table with your vector embeddings and that really captures the meaning of your data. And then the third stage is, hey, I have these vectors. Let's let's perform some kind of search. Let's Let's now use the vectors we have to be able to understand true meaning and drivers. And that's when the search element comes in. We have inbuilt vector functions. Again, you can do this with just one or two lines of SQL, um, and most of, and that's what you'll see later on um, in this notebook. Is it's very, very simple to to perform that semantic search that is able to extract meaning and 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 figure out themes um, within your data. So going back to the three stage process, the first stage is storing vectors. We have a blob type for this. Uh, it's super easy to bring in data into single store. We have a built-in function called JSON array pack. And this is a, a, a schema we're seeing a lot of user, uh, customers use today where they bring in a JSON string, which has some kind of uh, arrays that come in from their embedding models. And they can use JSON array pack into your insert statements. And we understand that. And we represent it as a blob type, understanding it's a vector. And to get it in a readable format, we have JSON array unpack. Um, and then the second, the second aspect of what we do in database, and we do extremely performant, where we're SIMB, uh, uh, you know, compatible. So we're extremely performant on this. Is the vector search, and there are two ways of looking at vector search. One is the dot product. So our dot product function is basically finding the the closest ang the angle between two vectors, and that ends up being a really good approximation for cosine similarity, especially when vectors are normalized to length one. So this is what we call a nearest neighbor search. You'll hear this as KNN in the industry. And this is saying, hey, you know, I have a vector X. I want to find the closest five vectors um, in cosine similarity to that, to that vector. And this function is actually a really, really good approximation for a semantic search, which is, you know, I have an input query. I want to find five results or, you know, how many ever results that are a very close semantic meaning to that input query. So in this case, that input query would, would be add V, and you can then look at it. You can then perform this against you know, 
all your all your vectors you have stored in your single store table and then pick hey these are the five you know vectors and then so called so forth text that has the most uh semantically similar meaning to my input query and then the second one is euclidean distance uh and the difference between this is this is straight line distance so as the bird flies between these two vectors it's not just the angle uh and this is more relevant for other ml use cases like k means clustering um where you want to create a cluster uh, you want to create a group you want to group data points together and then find you know distances between centroids and data points again this ha both of these functions are are uh sql statements that you can run super easily it's again one or two lines of sql and and, and i think that's that's cool about running semantic search with sql in single store and now let's go to the demo so i have put together a very simple quick uh demo where i'm going to share my uh link on the chat i'm not sure if it's sent on the chat but this is the uh oh i don't think i sent it to the right place uh, this okay, i think the link will be coming out but it's this link um where you can download this notebook uh and follow along but i think the first step is you navigate uh to singlestore.com uh create an account we will give you some free credits to play around with uh once you create that account you can then create a, a workspace group and a workspace uh, workspace of size S00 is sufficient. So we're just doing on a small data set. Uh, once you navigate to that GitHub single store labs repo, you can download the notebook I'm going to be working with. So that I'm assuming you guys can see my screen, but the notebook is um, on, on, on the repo here under notebook.ipynb. Uh, you can download that. And when you do download that, you can bring that notebook into single store by going here. So you, you navigate to this is your single store portal when you have you know created an account and logged in. Uh, you go to notebooks, you go, uh, you can go to this button here and then import from file, you know, browse your files, uh, and then pick your pick your notebook. So that'll bring in the notebook we have in our GitHub repo right into your single store development environment. To create a workspace, um, I'm just going to walk through this so that you know we can we can do this together, and you can stand a chance to win the AirPods that Matt was talking about earlier. But to create a workspace, you will have to first create a workspace group, um, which is it's this interface that we'll see here. Um, you can pick your cloud provider, you can pick your region that works best for you, uh, and then create a workspace of size S zero zero. So let's say you've done you've done both. Uh, both things, and now you're, you know, you're in a uh, single store portal. You have a workspace set up, and you have your notebook running. This is what you'll ideally see. Just give me a second. So you, you you will you will have a notebook. That. So this is the 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 notebook that you will see, uh, which says you know semantic search with hugging face models and and data sets. Um, so you know like I said, first step is creating that workspace. S zero zero is sufficient. The second step is just running, and, and that's the cool thing with working with notebooks and single stores. You can run SQL code alongside Python code uh, and have it super easy to develop. So you can first create a database called Semantic Search. Um, once you have created that database, you will need to go to this drop down here and select the database. So here I have Workspace One. I want to do you know work on my my Semantic Search workspace, um, my my database. Sorry. And the cool thing with that is, you know, zero connection strings. You don't have to think about how do I connect to my data source? How do I, how do I figure out my connection strings? None of that. So we just, you know, drop down, select your database and let's get going. Um, the next stage is, you know, bringing in the right libraries. Um, in this case, we're going to be bringing in a data set and a model from, set, from Hugging Face. The data set is some movie reviews we found on Hugging Face from an IMDb movie. Um, and we'll be using a sentence transformer model from them. So these are the required libraries that make this extremely easy to work with. And then after that, you want to load in your sentence transformer model. 
So this is the sentence transformer model, the paraphrase multilingual mini LLM. It's a pretty small model and it works really well. So we, you know, you can bring it into your, your notebook. Uh, and then once you bring this in, you can create a function that calls this model that generates embeddings. And this is the function we're going to be, you know, we talked about embeddings throughout. This is the, the function that takes in an input string and then outputs an array that represents the vector embedding of the input string. So that's the key thing of what we're doing. We're, we're passing in a bunch of text data that we have. We're trying to get vector embeddings out. And vector, vector embeddings are the semantic sort of meaning of each data point that you have, data, data row that you have in single store. Uh, the next step is being able to load in uh, your data from Hugging Face. And again, you can just do this with the load data set library. Just point it to the right Hugging Face data set. So in this case, the, the IMDb movie. Um, and we only want to, you know, for the interest of time, let's reduce sample size. We're only going to do this on 100 rows and we'll create a data frame from this. Now, this is this is where like we start working with vectors a bit more. And this is just again one line of one line of Python where you can take in your uh, your data with 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 text. In this case, in the review column, and we want to be able to apply the embeddings for, uh, function that we created to create a new column called review embeddings. And review embeddings is basically a, a new column on this on the same on the same data frame that represents, that has the vector uh, notation of each entry. And then we'll insert this into single store. Uh, when you insert this into single store, you will just need to do sort of a data frame to SQL with SQL Alchemy and run this code. And then you'll see this kind of statement come up where it'll create, you don't have to worry about um, you know, the schemas. We'll infer the schemas and we'll also you know, get the data in. So behind the scenes, we're converting it to SQL, creating a table for you. Uh, and once you do that, you will see in your workspace, so I'm using workspace, uh, this workspace here. In your workspace, you'll see a table called semantic search. You can see it. Uh, you'll see a, a database called semantic search, sorry. You'll see a table called reviews. And when you go to the sample data tab, you'll see, hey, there are reviews and rec review embeddings. And these are, this is the, if you see this, it's a sign that you have the right vectors of the right format in your, in your database. And then from there, let's run the semantic search. So it's it's as simple as, like I said, one line of SQL, which is you're doing a dot product of every everything in the review embeddings column with your search embedding. So in this case, my search embedding is me putting in an input string. And then I want to just be able to say, hey, give me the five reviews that reflect whatever I put in the input string. So the first example I did was, you know, the input string was put the word gripping. You know, like just want to find, you know, which which cost, which review, uh, which people who watched the movie and found it reviewing. Simple as that. And you can see none of these reviews actually refer to the word gripping at all, but it's sort of the sentiment behind it. Uh, in this case, we can see a score as well. So, you know, how 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 similar the the review text is to the actual input, uh, in this case, gripping. And here we see the review is, you know, it's pretty, you know, this 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 person who watched the movie was, was quite entertained by it, was quite uh, enjoyed by it, like, you know, enjoyed the time. No mention of the word gripping, but, you know, being able to capture the sentiment. And we can, we can, we can do this for, uh, let me just run this one second. We can also do this for other, um, uh, uh, other input text. You have a input search box that allows you to, you know, play around with it. And I think that that's something that we should all experiment is when you when you can put in a any input string you want, whether that this is bad, this is ugly, uh, you know, I had a great time, I was I was, you know, bored, I was I was very moved by it. And we'll, we'll be able to point the, the reviews that have the closest semantic meaning to it. And again, this is very different from full text or, or typical other search categories where, you know, it's based on the keywords you put in. We're able to, you know, take whatever input you put, and you can be a paragraph as well. Extract what you're trying to reflect from that from that search string, and then compare it to what the reviewers felt and what they wrote about, and and drive semantic search from that. So that's sort of the the overall process of it. I will uh, I will go back to my my deck, and and we can yeah, like like I said, we can uh, we can ha happy to take any questions and go through more more demos, but 
please, if you could follow along, uh, you know, the GitHub repo is up here. I'm sure it'll be sent around from, from our team. Um, and you can create this work, uh, this notebook, play around with it, um, and, and run a semantic search as we did today. So that's the first element, you know, and we're seeing in, in, in a large, um, LLM structure, semantic search is at its very, very core. It's the most, you know, first thing that customers have to do to be able to communicate with their LLMs. So the next big topic that does come up is, hey, how do I improve my semantic search results? You know, it's, if I just do a simple create embeddings, I'm not entirely sure I'll get the best results. And these are things that we're patterns we're seeing with our customers today. Firstly, they want SQL based filtering. And there's certain reasons for this. Firstly, enhanced security. You only want to be able to perform semantic search on vectors that are related to the user. This ensures that I'm not performing, you know, a semantic search on vectors on that I do not have access to. And a SQL based filter, SQL based filtering is how we go about that. Secondly is, is uh, improved relevance. So you can be able to narrow down on category. And this is, again, you can do this with SQL where you have like a where category is something. So you only perform semantic search on vectors that reflect a certain category. And the other, other benefit of SQL-based filtering is you have improved performance. You're not performing it on your entire corpus of data. You're just doing it on things that match your, 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 your input category. So you get much, much improved performances. And the, like a, a use case that a customer came to us was, you know, hey, I want to find the top K items in each category. They couldn't do this with Millipus. And with single store, it's very easy with our SQL, full SQL support. You know, we support filters, ranking, aggregation. So you get the best of that SQL world where we are a, you know, a fully distributed SQL database and you can use that to marry your vectors. The second thing is choosing the right chunk size. And this wasn't super applicable in our demo because you know, it's a small amount of data, it's just a small amount of review text, but being able to you know, take an entire PDF of data or, or, or pages and paragraphs and books of data and knowing when to and where to chunk it and what to create embeddings of is, is firstly an art and B, it's very, very important. Uh, this involves a lot of experimentation and there is you know, performance result trade-off. The smaller you create these chunks, the more specific you'll get the embeddings of because you know, it reflects a small amount of data, but that means the number of rows of vectors you have just blows up exponentially. So there's no real formula, there's no real you know, math to this. It's more so playing around with your use case and understanding, hey, am I going for something that needs to be extremely precise, extremely exact? Go for a smaller chunk size. Or, you know, is it more general meaning and I value being able to perform a semantic search faster? You can go for a larger chunk size. But yes, chunking your data is very, very important in this process. And we're also learning about, you know, throughout for each use case, what works well and what doesn't work well. Uh, and then the last thing is, uh, something that but Mariker was also, we were talking about it a couple of days ago, and we we're seeing this pattern uh, emerge again and again, which is, hey, you know, I want to be able to combine a bunch of different embedding models. And all of the embedding models have different results, whether you're using OpenAI ADA, you're using a different sentence transformer model. They all sort of, you know, specialize in, in, in different things. And what, what, what often happens is if you just use one model against, you know, all your data, some of the core differentiation and the core meaning behind you know, the different vectors and the different categories gets lost. So a pattern we're seeing, and, and, and I use this example of a, a you know, e-commerce store that sells products across you know, many different categories and has a set of reviews is, is they'll first split their data into each category. So like you know, electronics you know, for, for, for home appliances, and within each category, they'll use a specific embedding model. And within this embedding model, you can fine tune it. So that a lot of these embedding models like LLMs have this fine tune process where you can improve the relevance of that embedding model in your category. And when you fine tune it, the, the, that embedding model becomes really, really good and specialized on one single category. And for across all your categories, let's say you have five categories, you'll have five different embedding models. Uh, next, when you perform a semantic search, you will perform a semantic search against using each of the embedding models you have, creating on, on the input string, and then you know, compare it against all of the vectors you have in each category, and you'll combine the results together. And what this, this helps is it prevents you know, crowding out of all your results being too similar or too close to that one product category, and ensures that you can you know, take a more diverse set and have embedding models that are very, very specific and really good at, 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 at you know, 
taking text in one category and then creating a vector in it. And I think the last point that um, Madhukar and I can we can we can talk about this together, I guess, is you know what makes single store a really good choice um, for semantic search workloads. So, like we said earlier, you know we have full SQL support, and with that, Madhukar mentioned this: our analytical engine, our analytical engine is is you know really really awesome, and we can tie in our OLAP queries and our OLAP engine with. We, what we call hybrid search. And we do this in milliseconds. And this is a, a repeated pattern we're seeing a lot of our customers be very excited for is, hey, you know, I could perform a semantic search first, but I want to be able to, you know, augment these results with real-time analytical queries. And, 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 and I think the way this works is you first perform your, your, you know, your semantic search, like here you find your nearest neighbor search algorithm. And then you can come join this with your with your OLAP queries. We have a blog on this with uh, on, on a movie recommendation app we built, uh, where we do something very similar. We perform a semantic search against your input string, but we also provide in other analytical features like you know what other customers rated it, what customers similar to your demographic liked it, and being able to you know change the score and relevance based on both these things is is going to be extremely extremely important going forward. Um, the other thing to note is, I, 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 and I've been quite deliberate with this, I mentioned hybrid search here. Uh, another pattern we're seeing a lot of our customers you know, leverage is semantic search plus full text search. And I think that's a cool scenario. We, we're sort of calling it hybrid search, uh, where you can take your, your, your typical semantic search results with a dot product here and marry that with our full text search capabilities, where we do have, you know, single store is performance on, 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 on full text search and be able to marry the two results and provide uh, you know, recommendations or anything back to the user that, that has elements that, you know, being able to extract things from the semantic search, but also ground full text search capabilities. Um, and then the second thing is we're really good at ingesting data. We are able to ingest data from a variety of sources, let's say Kafka in this case. Uh, and when you bring in this, you know, speed of ingestion of data, what single store ends up being is a hub of very fresh, of very recent, of very relevant data. And you can do a couple things with this. Firstly is pass that data to your, your, your LLMs on your models for reinforcement learning. This is a, you know, a key part of, of, of all LLMs and, and embedding models is, is being able to you know, tune it to your data. And, and that, that real-time reinforcement learning messaging is, is you know, very important with single store. And the second thing is what I alluded to earlier with, with our OLAP queries. So when you're, when you're performing a semantic search, not only do you have the most recent vectors of the most re recent and most fresh data, but you also have you know, real-time data of usage and real-time data of, of, of firmographics and, and, and you know, how other customers are interacting with, with your data set. And being able to you know combine real time vectors, real time and, and real time data is is you know possible today with with single store pipelines. So the end user is able to not just query and get real time results, but also being able to you know get hyper personalized results is what we like to think about it, where it's 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 augmented by by other uh, predictive AI elements. Uh, Madhukar, I'm not sure if you want to we want to take this. I know you do an amazing job of this slide, but this is a, a, a you know wrap up on our key product capabilities. Um, Madhukar mentioned you know we are something we're, we are some a universal storage, and and that's key to our our architecture that makes us really good for you know transactions, analytics, and now also contextualizing data. Uh, we have fast ingestion, is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we now have Mongo API, so bring we can power up your 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 JSON analytics with our Mongo API with single store Kai. Uh, we have we are multi model, so you can use a bunch of different data types. You know, in your semantic search, being able to create a bunch of vectors from you know all sorts of your data on single store. We run everywhere, and the cool thing is, like I I think I, in in my demo is 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 the notebook, and I think that's centered to what we're doing. Um, in this AI space, you can quickly prototype, build your, you know, bring in your models, bring in your data from Hugging Face into your notebooks, perform, you know, cool, cool, little, small, little level or, or even big level anal analytics like uh, the semantic search we ran and, and notebooks is the key of it. And eventually we'll be looking into, you know, operationalizing these notebooks so you can take them into production super easily. 
So yeah, yeah nice. and I can explain as well. But uh, just to just to add to this, because there's a bunch of questions coming in, and maybe some folks are not familiar with OLAP or OLTP. So if you think about the two different categories of databases, there's the transactional, so that's the OLTP or online transaction processing. And then when you collect all the transactional data and you want to run some analytics on it, typically they, you would then move that data into a data lake or a data warehouse, and then you might want to run some sort of analytics on it. When you run analytics, the databases that are more fine-tuned for analytics is called OLA or online analytics processing. And typically that is more optimized for running analytics. So you would have a columnar database instead of a row-based database. And a columnar database uh, is optimized so you can run aggregations, average, those kind of things. Now imagine if you want to run both analytics and transaction, it is today extremely hard because you would do ETL. So single store actually started off as a real time or in memory row based database. So if you're familiar with Redis, so if you're familiar with Memcache, uh, no, we were almost similar or exact. And then over a period of time, we built a three tier architecture that goes from in memories to SSDs and NVMEs to finally into S3 object to manage volume. And we created this patented thing called a uh, single store storage that allows you to store the data both in rows as well as in columnar. You could either specify it or over a period of time based on the usage it goes over. And so what you are seeing today, what Panav showed today, when you go sign up for single store, that's the cloud version. And you can go create a new workspace. In that workspace is think of it as a EC2 instance where you're running all your SQL and processing. And then you go create a database and you connect the two, right? And then within the, uh, and maybe Pranav, if you can go back to sharing your screen, what you can then do is on the left-hand side of the menu, you have a bunch of, you have a bunch of uh, tools or links. One is, are you, are you sharing your screen? Yeah. So if you zoom in a little bit, what you see is on the left-hand side are what we call as workspaces. And within workspaces, you have uh, an EC2 instance. So that's a separation of compute with your database. So for example, in this one, there's something called Arno Comet Workspace 1. And on the right-hand side are all the databases associated to it. This workspace is currently suspended. Uh, you can you know, suspend it or automatically get suspended so you're not paying for it all the time. This one, yeah, so this one's connected. So what you can do is you can go into the database as uh, Pranav had shown, and when you click on the database uh, name, you can see all the tables. And then if you click on the sample data, then it basically gives you that uh, set of tables and the data in it. So this shows you that this is a vector. Uh, you're storing it as vectors. That's why it's in binary on the right-hand side. But on the left-hand side, under the develop module, if you click on SQL editor, you can run any SQL command here. You can choose your database and the workspace from the top, and then you can basically type out any SQL and it works. And effectively, if you want to create a full stack application and talk to it, it will just use a MySQL string or it could use a Mongo string. And you can run millions of transactions per second, or you can run analytics on top of that. The one thing I will add is if you go to the notebooks, uh, Pranav, yeah, go to any one of these notebooks. One thing that we have also added, and this will be, I believe it's now available to everybody, is on the top right hand, there's something called Code with Squirrel. And if you click on that, you can actually ask uh, Squirrel, which is our chatbot, which uses OpenAI in the background to generate the code for you. So a bunch of questions that came in today, 
like, hey, how do I create an embedding or can you generate a code for creating a new table or can you write SQL for me to go and do a dot product search? You can just do all that and it will generate the code for you. And once it has generated the code, you can even just add it into your notebook and save it. And then you can run it in the future. So that's kind of a quick, uh, quick and you know early version of notebook on what uh, what you can do with it. Think of it as you know a prototyping layer or a layer where you can go and create both Python as well as SQL code intermingled together. And that's what uh, Pranav has shown. And coming soon, once Notebook is generally available, right now it's in limited release, you'll be able to even call native OpenAI embeddings functions directly from here. So now let's go through the questions, Matt. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Madhukar. Uh, I've got a list here. We're going to now begin Q&A. Reminder, the Q&A functionality is at the bottom of your Zoom console, so we'll keep on trying to, uh, to collect them as they come in. We'll see how many we can get to. Um, I'm going to go with the first one here is from Julian. How is this better than Milvis or Pinecone? Are there any comparison metrics or considerations? You want to take that one, Madhukar? Or? Yeah, um, and others can jump in. How is this different from Pinecone? So think of it as an uh, enterprise-grade, multi-model distributed database that can do both SQL, JSON, time series, and uh, key value, and so on. So why is that different? Because unlike a vector-only database, whether it's Pinecone or whether it's even Milvis, VV8 and so on, those can only store vectors. Whereas for us, we can store the user attributes and we can also store JSON data coming in from your transaction system. And we can also store vectors. So that could effectively mean that I can do a simple search that will tell you, tell me what is the, uh, favorite movies of people living in California between the ages of 25 and 35, then extract uh, the list, re-rank it based on a semantic search with a specific language and then segment it. And you can do all of that in one single SQL statement. And all of the responses comes back in milliseconds. So for example, to somebody ask this question about some benchmarks, which we'll get into deeper, but typically what you can do is you run an image semantic search. We were able to go through 16 million records and come back with a match in five milliseconds. Now, if you were using Pinecone or VV8 or something else, you would continue to pour in the data into vector format and Pinecone while the rest of the data is sitting somewhere else in some other database. So effectively, you would have to do extract, transform, load. You would have to keep that data fresh. And every time you create embeddings, if you're using a commercial model, it's going to cost you. And so you would have a way to figure out how to keep the data in sync. And it causes overhead in terms of latency. Now, imagine if your user is waiting for a query, and that takes a few seconds to get back even before it goes to an LLM. That is a very poor experience. And then, of course, uh, you know the newer vector-only databases, they're still catching up on disaster recovery, multi-AZ, any kind of distributed features that currently already exist in enterprise databases like Sigma Store. Good stuff. Here's another question. This one is from Anonymous. It is, is Single Store faster than other distributed databases? Eric, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. I can take that one. Um, yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. But single store is really fast for a number of reasons. Uh, one is um, we compile queries to machine code. So that gives us about a 10x performance boost compared to the legacy databases that have a B-tree access method and do not compile to machine code. So 
Um, you know, just doing an insert takes like one tenth as many CPU instructions as as it did on a legacy B tree system like a, like a MySQL or Postgres or SQL Server, Oracle, et cetera. Um, and we have an in-memory row store structure. If you want the fastest, you know, insert and single row type update and lookup capabilities. Um, and we also have a column store structure, which we've now evolved to something we call a universal storage. And so column store has, you know, it stores each column separately on disk and it uses very modern uh, query execution methods that process a batch of say 4,000 rows at a time. And it only needs to load the columns that your query touches. And it uses what's known as vectorized query execution, which is not to be confused with vector database at all. It's just different use of that word. But basically, we can, you know, we can process rows with just like a few instructions per row in the, the best code pass for a column store. So, and we scale out, you know, we can shard data across multiple nodes. So the combination of scale out and that in-memory row store, disk-based column store, compiling queries to machine code, and that vectorized query execution with low overhead per row, all of that makes us extremely fast. And we're also very fast on the ingest code path in addition to the query and update. Good stuff. Eric, as long as you're you're here with us, I saw another question you were going to answer, but we can just make it for the audience. Is the cost model the same for your cloud and on-premise solution? Um, so they're both based on the notion of units. So um, the unit for cloud is um, eight vCPUs and 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, I believe, and then for on-prem, it's um, eight vCPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. So it's it's that's there's a slight difference there, but um, you know when you license on-prem, you know you you work with us to find you know to and when we uh, arrange purchase with you, we'll quote you a price per per unit. Um, same thing for cloud. So. Um, yeah, it's based on units. Now in cloud, there's more subtleties to, you know, you don't have to burn your units all the time. Like if you pause, pause a workspace in the cloud, um, we um, there are pricing models where, you know, you don't pay while the system is paused except for the storage that you're using. And so I don't have, you know, you know, we can, you know, our our sales and account teams, you know, you ask them and they'll they'll give you full details on the pricing. Yeah, one thing I would add to that, I know there are a bunch of folks who's asked questions around uh, pricing or some people might run into issues or have reported running into issues on running your code that we shared. Feel free to reach out to us in two different ways. You can log into the application itself or the cloud portion and there's a chat bar at the bottom. And when you chat with somebody, we will set up a meeting and we can uh, troubleshoot with you further. Or if you're not able to do that for whatever reason, send us an email at team, T E A M, at singlestore.com, and we'll get a solution uh, expert and set up a meeting with you and we'll help you do this for whatever use case that you're doing. We do have a very large assortment of notebooks as well. So, depending on what kind of uh, use case you want to run, specific your data, we can definitely jump on a call and try to bring in your data, and help you out with that. Uh, one last question I see, uh, maybe Akmal or Eric, you can take this and then I can add on to it. How is it useful for knowledge graph building and KG embedding? Will the output, can the output be used for that? Can we use GQL in this? Um, so for graph data, um, we recommend you use in, model it in, in tables, you know, model your relationships like edges and nodes and, and tables. And we do have a feature called uh, recursive common table expressions for you to do graph and tree traversal uh, in SQL. Um, so that that's what we recommend for graph traversals at this point. Yeah, and just to add what Eric was saying there. So uh, earlier this year, I looked at the recursive CTE. So I'm a big fan of the London Underground. So I got a great example of how to find routes on the London Underground using exactly that. Oh, nice. <laughs> 
Yeah, and then the only other thing I would add to this is just like any enterprise database, we do have API level at uh, with uh, our back at row level. So if you are looking to do just CRUD level operations, you can use our APIs as well. And if you're specifically looking to for using GQL, then you can create a wrapper around for that too. Good stuff. We've got a uh, couple more questions and time for questions, but I also have a poll. We're interested in what uh, what everyone is interested in learning about in the future. We've got we've got lots of webinars that we do weekly, as I mentioned. So I'm going to launch this poll, and we'll collect some of your thoughts while I continue the questions here. Um, okay, so the next question, Shiva, can single store be used as a caching layer for Snowflake? I don't know if Eric, you want to take that or? Um, yeah, definitely. So I, we're single store shines is interactive response time. So we compile qu queries to a, a compiled execution plan. So if the same query comes again with different parameters. We'll recognize that and we can grab the plan that we already compiled and run it. And so we can run queries with interactive response time, like down to millisecond level response time. Um, Snowflake usually has a minimum response time that's like a large fraction of a second. Um, so that's, it, it is feasible and it may be uh, important to you if you want a uh, really fast interactive response time that might be an appropriate use. Yeah, so I'll add to that. We have several customers that use us as an augmentation for Snowflake and a couple of reasons for that. One is, because Snowflake, as you know, it's object store. So the data has to go all the way to the object store for a commit before you can run any analytics on it. If you put single store, one, we have pipelines. These are four lines of SQL code that has a connector to Parquet files. And we can pull in that data and we do a really fast commit. So which means as the pipelines are running to ingest the data, you can run queries on it. And that's one way to do fast, uh, you know, our split second analytics on it. And so what you could potentially do is again, put a single store. And if you're not looking to bring in the entire data from Snowflake, you can create a pipeline and then start running analytics on that. That's one option. The second option of course, is we are also working closely with Snowflake. So, they recently announced something called containerized services. And because you can run single store as a container, both either in the cloud or in your own VPC, you could run that as well in single store uh, in, inside of containerized service and Snowflake. But keep in mind that was just announced. So that's still a work in progress. And we'll take another four or five months before they GA and then we'll be able to do this as well. Good stuff. Akmal, I'm going to give this one to you just so, because I've seen you do webinars and content on this topic, but it's from Yash. Um, how does single store help with predictive models? Oh, that's good. So we've done, I've done a bunch of stuff on, on this in the past. I mean, the main benefit that we have, uh, if you're doing a lot of kind of in database machine learning, which single store supports through its vector functions, I mean, those have been around for a long time. And I build a movie recommender system where we're storing everything in the, the, the database system itself and actually getting it to do the hard work. So rather than having to code it myself, essentially push it down into the database system. And then, as Eric was uh, mentioning earlier, because we are a distributed database system as well, I mean, essentially the workload gets distributed. Um, and that, again, makes better use of resources. So building these kind of predictive models, re recommender systems, very easy to do. We've got lots of links we can share as well, Matt, in terms of uh, content. So uh, that's something we can follow up with. Um, I just had a quick, uh, but maybe if, uh, if not putting Pranav on the point there, I think there was a request, uh, uh, Pranav, someone was asking what happens if you kind of, rather than putting the text in, okay, you, you put a whole bunch of like garbage in, garbage out kind of thing, you know, uh, exclamation mark or numbers or something like that, how would it evaluate it? Well, it's probably not going to make very much sense of it, I think. Um, and, you know, because we're trying to get the sentiment in terms of the meaning of it. And if you're putting in stuff that it doesn't really know anything about, and I assume that you're, you're going to get <laughs> poor results. Yeah. 
Akmal's Ex exactly right. Like the, the quality of the semantic search is solely dependent on the quality of data you do pass it in. Uh, and the model's ability to extract, you know, the right the right things and build the right vectors that have the right meaning. So Akmal's spot on there. You can pass, you know, you can pass these models pretty much anything, but for it to be a a relevant and a good result, you know, you need you need data that that actually you know reflects your customers or reflects something real. Yeah, and just to uh, add, add to that, when you do a dot product, you could get back the ranking for that result as well for that query. So the input is the query, and the output is what your the vectors that you're trying to do a semantic search again. And if the match ranking is 1.0, and it's a perfect match because it's matching against maybe itself, closer to one is good match and closer to minus one is no match at all. So if you put in garbage or if you put in certain things that has no match, you will see the ranking. Mm -hmm. So good best practice or best practice is to be able to look at that rank and then re-rank it if you need to. And then based on that input or based on that output, then figure out if you want to contextualize that data with LLM or you want to throw it away. All right, good stuff. I think we have time for one more question before we announce the AirPods winner and wrap things up. Eric, I think this is probably best for you. What is the difference between SQL databases and this database? Um, short answer, this is a SQL database. Long answer, um, we're a multi-model, modern distributed SQL database. And the legacy databases are not distributed and they don't, they're not necessarily multi-model to the extent that we are. So by multi-model, I mean, we can support structured data, semi-structured data with JSON, full text search, time series, vector search, um, and spatial. So um, check out our, you know, if you, you know, you can search our documentation about, you know, different data models we support, search for, you know, single store multi-model or ask, uh, ask squirrel to explain to you the multi-model support in single store and it'll give you a good answer. Good stuff. All right. Uh, we can wrap things up and announce that winner. As I mentioned during the intro, though, to reminder tomorrow that we will be presenting another webinar, how to build a chat GPT app using JSON data. Feel free to register. That link is in the chat right now. And now the announcement. Today's AirPods winner goes to Dino Vital, who is a cloud solutions architect at TD Securities in New York. Congrats and thank you for joining, Dino. If that's not you, don't give up because we are going to announce one more AirPods winner by the end of the day for anyone who has tried out the GitHub demo. Check your email for that in the next hour or so. I'm also going to post that in the chat. Um, but yeah, I want to thank Pranav and Madhukar for an awesome presentation today. Thank you to Akmal and Eric for joining the support team. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining today. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Bye.